So John, yeah. we think Echo is related to a wolf in some way. Undoubtedly, <laughs> both of your dogs are. <laughs> That's true. Yes, they're they're just they're just dogs with better manners. That's all. <laughs> I remember I reading say a wolves study. With better manners. Yeah. It's, it was like a I can't remember where I read this. So this is nobody should quote me on this because I'm I'm remembering from my memory, which is terrible. But about how if you in a certain number of generations you could kind of tame a wolf by picking the most um, kind of like floppy eared one out of the bunch and in you know yes. and reading it with it again and again and then in about five generations you kind of got a dog. Uh, right. I, th I think the thing you're talking about is with foxes. And uh, mm -hmm. and yes, some experiments have been done in the early 20th century um, showing that you could domesticate a fox in, in relatively short order. I mean, generations, but not, not too many generations. So Yeah, I think that was a National Geographic article, actually. Mm -hmm. And I think the swaggy tail, too, right? The curved tail was yeah. also yeah. indicated? Yeah, or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the tail went down, the ears went down, and everything. Right. Moved. It, was, <laughs> it was like... Tame. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I guess they, at that point, because they couldn't hear as well, would need to depend on humans for food, right? So. Oh, uh, right. You know, I'm not sure what the uh, connection is with the floppy ears. You know, uh, the thing that would have been being selected for would be, you know, kind of a, a more mellow personality, mm -hmm. uh, but um, which, for which there'd be genetic basis for. Uh, but these, but if, if you go for the gene that you're interested in, it often brings along other genes that you may not care about, or even genes are a little bit detrimental. And so you kind of get the whole package, even though it's the, the thing you're mainly interested in with the canid would be, would be that kind of docile, uh, friendly sort of uh, behavior. Right. Very interesting. So John, you've got a slide deck. I do. Yes. Uh, it's uh, ready to go anytime that that's uh, right. And well, it's a, at the moment, it's just a title. So uh, do I have permissions to do that right now? Oh, I do. Um, oh. Not yet, not yet. I'm gonna, um, I have a few introductory slides first. Oh, perfect, yes, of course. And, uh, and you can, you. I'm sure you can share screen now, um, by the yeah. way, we're, we're all set up. Uh, and I'm gonna wait till on the hour. We have um, already, gosh, 146 participants and more growing by the moment. So don't get nervous, Becky. <laughs> you guys are both educators so you're used to audiences right <laughs> well and if you're joining us for the first time you know husky bites is basically just an informal um setting where we can learn something new and um and uh kind of enjoy um fellowship there's it turns out that most of the people joining us have some sort of connection with michigan tech not everyone um uh we have you know, not everyone, in other words, not everyone is a graduate, but but pretty much mostly everybody who has joined us has heard about Husky Bites um, from one source or another. Um, and that means they're either a Husky or related to a Husky or the um, uh, daughter-in-law of a Husky or, or you know, <laughs> just kind of go down the list or they're, they're they are, yeah. Well, John, you, you basically meet almost all those criteria. <laughs> I, on the other hand, am a fake Husky, um, having earned my degree from another university, which is the University of Connecticut, where their mascot happened to be a Husky. So I, I claim being a Husky, but I'm a fake Husky, I'm afraid. <laughs> but I do have a Husky, or at least Greg does. Um, the Husky is his and the Labrador is mine. <laughs> that works. Yeah. Yeah, right. I was a a red hawk from Miami of Ohio, but now are we're we're now the red hawks. They were the redskins when I was there, but of oh, course that has been changed now. So but uh that was a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I am working on sharing my screen. Can you see yeah. my slides? Mm -hmm. All right. Um and uh oh I didn't want to do that. I want actually real view. And I've already messed it up. I do this every week. You would think I would get it right one of these days, but I'm going to try to go with this. All right, so it is six o'clock on the dot, and I just want to welcome everyone for joining us for um, Husky Bites, uh, a free Zoom webinar that we also Facebook live stream and that we also record so you can 
find it later if you happen to miss one. We post them all on the College of Engineering at Michigan Tech website. Um, this is sponsored by Michigan Technological University. And my name is Janet Callahan. I am the Dean of the College of Engineering. And I'm so glad you've joined us tonight. Um, so I have just a couple of, of strange updates. Um, I've been out of town again, as you could tell from last week, uh, and, uh, where I was able to meet um, some amazing folks. So before I left town, um, Bob and Nelva dropped me off some Van Hagel cookies, or Jan Hagel cookies, excuse me, and some um, copper nuggets. These are seen on the right. Uh, don't mistake one for the other or really break your teeth, but um, these cookies lived in, in the back seat of my car where I could reach them while driving down to Chicago and driving back. So I, I ate an enormous amount of these cookies and they're delicious. Um, it was wonderful. They were up here for the game. Uh, and uh, um, Jim is an East E graduate from, from 71. Uh, and then while in Chicago, I was able to meet, um, sorry, Bob is a graduate from, um, well, sorry, I'm all mixed up. While I was in Chicago, I was able to meet Jim and Jean, and Jim is a 71 ECE graduate, uh, and you can see them on the left. Uh, and uh, and then I also was able to meet um, a new um, person who I hadn't met before. Actually, I hadn't met Jim or Jean before either, um, Harry. Uh, and so I unfortunately lost a photo of him, but I just wanted to just say I had a great time in Chicago. And the reason I've been meet, like I actually reached out to both Jim, um, and to Harry is because they have been faithful Husky Bitesers, um, meaning that they join us um, many, many times, almost all the time. So it was just truly wonderful to meet some Michigan Techers. And so um, Jim and Harry, you both share in common that you are ECE graduates and you graduated within one year of each other and you both love ham radio. So I'm gonna introduce you to each other through email later on. All right, so Jim Jim sent me um, a picture of his book bag. So I didn't know with a standard book bag at Tech uh, back in the 70s was a geologist rock bag. Did you guys know that, John? Did you know uh, yeah, that? I had one. It was it was even, the, it made it all the way into the 90s a little bit. It wasn't quite as common, <laughs> but, but I had one. <laughs> yeah, no, I was very impressed with this. And so, um, Becky, I'm embarrassing you here because I'm showing <laughs> a picture of your family. So Becky, this is my introduction to Becky now. So Becky Castle, I met um, um, through her. Um, so she is the daughter. She is the daughter-in-law of the um, daughter. You're the daughter. I'm the daughter. Yep. All right. I got that all mixed up in my mind. Yes. Um, of um, so so so. Tell me the name, the first name of your of your father. So my dad is Tom Lippart, and he graduated in '59 from Tech in metallurgical engineering. And um, so, yeah, and then, that's my dad. Yay. And so you um, married the, into this Castle family then. Right. Who uh, are central Pennsylvanians through and through. Everybody lives within about a mile of where we are, <laughs> which is that, wonderful. That's totally awesome. And so we can see here nearly the entire family. Your daughter is not here um, because she's here at Tech. Um, <laughs> exactly. In engineering. But um, Becky reached out to me and she kind of shared, she actually said, you you should have John on. Um, and, and hopefully during the talk, he'll explain a kind of the story of why, but I just wanted to kind of explain how, you know, Tom's granddaughter is now here back at tech. Uh, and while Becky did not go to tech, she is um, kind of like me, you know, like a, a Husky, right? <laughs> exactly. All right, and, so and I am a youper, so it, I mean, I was two months old when we moved up, but I, I consider myself a, a full blown youper. So there you go, <laughs> which I am not. Um, I'm I'm striving to become one. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the season we're coming up on the last three. Um, very next up is um, we will be hearing from Carolyn Duncan, uh, uh, and we've called this free falling because Carolyn studies falling. Uh, and she has, um, she scientifically studies it. And the, the purpose of doing that is to try to really help um, care, you know, it, as we get older, our reflexes change and our ability to catch ourselves from falling changes. And I believe she's gonna be talking, talking about that next week. Uh, and so I wanted to just mention what free falling was about. 
And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And John, you can go ahead and start your slides. And now I would like to introduce um, our featured speaker um, this evening, uh, John Vucetich. And uh, I hope I said that right. Yeah, very good. OK, I've been practicing. Uh, so John is a distinguished professor here at Michigan Tech. Um, he's also a fellow of the Martin School at the University of Oxford. Um, he was promoted to professor in 2014, uh, and since then he's been continuing to just um, continue his really amazing work. Um, we're going to be hearing about what he does. I just want to just mention that he's a really highly cited scholar who first earned his degree here at Michigan Tech with a Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences, and then his PhD in Forest Sciences. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, John, uh, to take it from here. Sure, great. Well, um, my, my goodness, uh, Janet, thanks for in inviting me. And, and Becky, thanks for joining me. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll just get started. So I've, I've been a wolf biologist and an advocate for carnivore conservation for 30 years. I have uh, led research on the populations of wolves and moose that live on Isle Royal National Park. I've done that for 20 years. Um, and that particular study is the longest study of any predator prey system in the world. It's been going on for more than, than 60 years. The, the basic idea of that research is to um, understand how it is that the wolf and moose populations are connected to each other through wolf predation. Wolf predation ends up being the uh, primary cause of death for the moose population. And of course, moose are the primary source of food for the, for the wolves. And I'm often asked, um, you know, of, of all the things that have ever been learned on Isle Royal and from all of my experiences, what's the most important lesson? And um, I decided after a number of years, I probably should write a book to offer my answer. And um, I think uh, you'll, you'll get to learn my answer to that question with a little bit of time that we have to share this evening. The, the book uh, that I wrote is called slides here, is uh, called Restoring the Balance. And the subtitle is What Wolves Tell Us About Our Relationship with Nature. The book is a little bit uh, little bit memoir, a little bit natural history of, of wolves and moose. There's a little bit of history of science, both science on Isle Royal, and then uh, broader trends in science because they help contextualize what it is that we've learned on Isle Royal, and then, uh, and then some environmental philosophy. And all these threads are kind of woven together uh, to form a single narrative. And uh, tonight, um, I'll share a few readings, and we'll intersperse those readings with some conversation between Becky and I, some of her reflections on the readings, and some uh, some questions and conversation that we might have about it. I think we'll have time for two or three readings. And for this first reading, uh, a little bit of context is useful. Um, each winter, uh, we have a field season. It lasts for seven weeks. Uh, that field season involves us uh, uh, living in a cabin in the woods right at the field site, and we fly in a small aircraft as long or as frequently as the weather allows us to. And from that small aircraft, we make observations of, of, of the wolves and the moose. And so here is from chapter one of, of Restoring the Balance. February 18th, 2012. Last night, the wolves of Chippewa Harbor Pack crossed the Greenstone Ridge to hunt in remote corners of their territory. By morning, they were traveling back to the core of their territory. Shortly after we caught up with them, not far from Little Todd Harbor, we watched them change course abruptly and straight into the wind. We saw what they smelled, a cow moose and her calf who had been themselves foraging. It didn't look good from, for the cow and the calf right from the beginning. The calf was too far away from her mother and they may have had different ideas about how to handle the situation. The wolves rushed in, the cow turned to face the wolves, expertly positioned between the wolves and her calf, but only for a second. The calf bolted. After a flash of confusion, the cow pivoted and did the same. Had she not, the wolves would have rushed past the cow and bloodied the snow with her calf. The break in coordination between cow and calf put four or five wind-thrown trees between the cow and her tender love. The cow hurled herself over partially fallen trunks, she caught up with her frantic calf before the wolves did. And then the chase was on. Led by the least experienced of them all, the calf. The cow, while capable of running faster, stayed immediately behind the calf, no matter what direction the terror-ridden mind of that calf decided to take. 
Every third or fourth step, the cow snapped one of her rear hooves back towards the teeth of death. One solid knock to the head would rattle the life even from a hound of hell. After a couple of minutes, and perhaps a third of a mile, the pace slowed. By the third minute, everyone was walking. The cow, the calf, and the wolves. The stakes were high for all, but not greater than the exhaustion they shared. Eventually, they all stopped. Not a hair's width separated the cow from the calf, and the wolves were just 20 feet away. The cow faced the wolves. A few minutes later, the wolves walked away. By nightfall, Chippewa Harbor Pack had pushed on another six miles or so, passing who knows how many more moose. Their stomachs remained empty. And then later in the same chapter, the few paragraphs that finished the chapter, um, and taking on a slightly different perspective here, in a typical year, most moose on Isle Royal are tested by wolves about once a month. No moose fails more than once, and most eventually fail the test. They die from circulatory shock, hypervolemia, insufficient blood pressure to the brain, or injury to some other vital organ, all preceded by an ocean of exhaustion, a lifetime of anxiety compressed into a moment held by a fast and shallow heartbeat, a light and vertiginous feeling in the head brought by low blood pressure, a dissociating numbness that is a true gift offered by a cocktail of endogenous biochemicals and suggestive that evolution may be more compassionate, if only by accident, than her reputation. Teeth, swinging hooves, bloody snow, spinning sky, faintness, a once proud and still massive shoulder hitting the ground hard, the tearing of flesh, fading, and then nothing. Now the reasoning and the rationalization begin. We try to squirm away to the easier thoughts. He was about to die anyways. He might have lived a bit longer, but his quality of life would have been so poor. We might even tell his story by replacing the pronoun he and his with it and its. We reason that the only other option is death by starvation or the infection that spreads from jaw necrosis. We praise death by predation for outmaneuvering those out alternative vehicles of death, mercy killing. But there's no reasoning here and little rationale for picking one horrible end over another. We pivot for other escape routes. Wolves keep the moose population healthy by killing weakened moose. To some limited extent, sure. In any case, these are all excuses for absolution from failing to give tragedy its due attention. These excuses diminish the majesty of a moose's life and the depth of his or her suffering. Excuses obscure the horror of death and the celebration of a dangerously brave life. They hide persistence to the point of absolute exhaustion, the extension of one life by the taking of another, and transformations of tissue and energy from one species to another, processes that have occurred each moment over the past billion years. Excuses conceal the flash ignited by the mundane smashing into this divine. Now our Paleolithic ancestors were the first in the history of all life to imagine the circumstances of their providers. That vital juxtaposition between living and dying demanded reconciliation. We developed ceremonies and rituals. Religion was born along with our capacity to imagine the circumstances of our victims. We no longer care for those primitive observances. Warm, pumping, bloody muscle is reduced to meat, stored in lockers, packaged into casings, and formed into patties. We eat, live, and kill without a thought. And so why would we be interested to read about wolves? because they remind us to think. And that was a little reading from chapter one of Restoring the Balance. And so Becky had a chance to read that before we were sharing it just now. And uh, well, I just wonder if you might have a thought or a question to, to share with us. Well, I think, um, I think the first thing that strikes me, especially the first time I read your book was really just me for pleasure. And then I was kind of re going through it this time, thinking about it from the perspective of teacher and my students. and. Um, I think one of the things that is so important about this book is it kind of really puts you into the setting of doing field science, whereas typically 
you know, when you're a high school teacher or, you know, any a teacher, science teacher, you know, we're wrapped up in labs that are occurring in neat little um, containers in a science lab um, facility that is, you know, how we do science. And yet uh, this really kind of brings to life like the reality of field science where uh, you are witnessing these things occurring and you've got to find clues from what you find. And um, somehow as a human, you have to kind of um, justify things or you might have a very difficult time doing this job. So. Yeah, no, no, and marvelous. Uh, thanks for sharing those thoughts. And, and um, you know, as, as you were sharing those ideas, um, what occurred to me now, which has occurred to me many times in the past, is that um, because of the intensity of the field work, especially in the wintertime, we're there for seven weeks. And so it's what we do all the time, day and night, essentially, everything is all about that. And so your lives really do get kind of intertwined with what their lives are, are all about. And um, yeah, the, the, it's, it's a curious experience for sure. So. Yeah, and I, I would just think that um, like day to day, really you're looking for signs of death either by the wolf or by the moose so there's a part of you i'm sure that's got to kind of sterilize that just because you know you can't get wrapped up in the horrors of this death because it is life it is the cycle of life but on the other hand um you do want to give it a little bit of due respect in that you know that was the life of an animal that has since perished yeah, no, 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 everything you're saying is so important. And I, of course, I don't know anything what it's like to be an emergency room medical professional, but of course, those kinds of people have to compartmentalize as, as well. And yeah, I, I, I think you're right. You just can't on a, on a every moment by every moment basis lived so amped up. Um, but at the same time, you absolutely have to take the, the moment to, from time to time, at least to kind of reflect on, on really what's happening. And, and again, I think for scientists, it can be a special challenge because the next thing we do quite fine, fine to do so is to turn that all into a bunch of numbers and turn it into graphs. And then much, much is lost. I mean, much is gained when we do that, but a great deal is lost. And so, it's right. And, you know, again, when you're, when we're talking science textbooks, you know, um, of which, as you mentioned, this is in, this study is in every biology book, probably in the world, but for sure in the nation, um, and so these students, all my students have read about this, you know, looked at the graph, answered questions from the graph. And so it is, it's, it's about the numbers and it's, it's, you know, you lose a little bit of sight because you need to, um, in kind of what's really happening. It's more just about comparing the numbers of the wolves versus the moose and, yeah, yeah. you know. Now, those, if you were to read, if you were to read a reading like that to some of your students, what do you think their reaction would be? Oh, <laughs> well, it would depend. There would yeah. be some that would be riveted, like, wow, that is just so interesting. And, and then there would be a few that would be uh, uh, horrified and probably would have to leave the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a little bit of horror is not an inappropriate reaction because it's horrifying. <laughs> it is horrifying. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, well, should we do another reading? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So for this, this is from chapter two, and, and chapter two is called Moose Thoughts. Mm -hmm. And Again, a tiny bit of context will help you out here. And if you joined us just before the top of the hour, or you heard a tiny bit of this. Um, moose are uh, bothered on an annual basis by something called winter tick. And these ticks, as the name suggests, uh, bother the moose during the wintertime. This photo gives just a little bit of a clue of what happens. The ticks can be so numerous. It's really kind of disturbing. Tens of thousands of ticks on one moose. They can cause the moose to lose their hair, as we see in this image. And our interest is to monitor how that may change from one year to the next, whether there's lots of ticks some years and fewer ticks other years. We use those that hair loss as, as, a, as a clue, a basic idea, and if, if there's more hair loss, then there's probably more ticks. And so um, we take photographs of moose in the springtime of as many moose as we can see, it can find. And uh, one of the things we do uh, to get more photos is to go to places where we think we might find moose, in the springtime, moose have a tendency to show up at mineral licks to get minerals that are in the water. And uh, what I'm gonna read you next is kind of in that setting. You need to know one other thing. This will seem weird at first, but it'll make sense in a moment. I'm camping next to a swamp and that explains the footwear that I'm wearing. So I sit behind the camera shutter, waiting for a moose to offer a complete profile of the hair loss on their left side and then their right side. But much of the time, just waiting for moose. By early afternoon, the morning chill has dissolved into light delirium 
induced by a tincture, tincture of swamp quietude and a brilliant spring sun. Tired of sitting, I reposition and take a turn standing, less standing and more draped over the tripod of my camera. Then a peculiar sensation, a little push from beneath the sole of my foam shoe, worn thin from the wilderness. I straighten up, feigning to myself that I hadn't been alert all along. Was I really that bored with standing? Whatever. I shift my weight and return to a hazier state of mind. Last summer's swamp sedges, dead and desiccated, stand tall and rustle in a light breeze. Green shoots are still only an accent to the beige, beige hues of early spring. I stand right at the swamp's edge, where the soil is soft with moisture but not saturated. Nothing particularly advantageous about this position, except just trying to be dry enough to keep water from percolating through the pinhole in the sole of my foam footwear. Again, the same funny sensation on the bottom of my foot. I shift my weight again. With the third push, I compare the observation against ideas suggesting the various ways which, by which I could be losing my faculties. I'm hungry, not really hungry, just bored hungry. The six-year-old the six-year-old in me is tired of standing. The grown-up in me is not going to reposition again so soon after the last repositioning. Then another push. Exasperated, I abandon my post in a huff, take one step aside, get down on my knees, push the grass aside to meet the pointed nose of the baseball-sized toad. She had been pushing her head against my thin-soled shoe with all the force she could muster with a toad push-up. She was trying to stretch out after a long winter's nap, her black eyes wide open, eye contact was unavoidable. Now I do not know the limits of toad cognition, and I fully expect that I am projecting the thought, but she seems disgusted in wondering whether I am more ignorant than insensitive or the other way around. A year before, at the same swamp, in the same disordered state of mind, a thought had occurred to me. I hadn't been looking at thoughts. I hadn't been looking for thoughts. Nevertheless, the autonomous narrator in my head proffered one. I was sitting in the wilderness counting what was left of the day's allotments of M&Ms, and then, how many moose does another moose know? Then the words, is it boring to chew cud for eight hours of a day? I wondered, what is it like to be a moose? The questions were not warmed by sentimentality, no. They struck me cold and horrifying. Let's say, if you were to select 100 people all at random, from all parts of the world and all walks of life, now, make that 100 million people, line them all up in order, from the least knowledgeable to the most knowledgeable, about moose. I would be pretty close to the front of that line, but I had no idea how to answer those questions. Soon afterward, I realized that moose were not merely alive, but that each moose has a life. A moose has memories of yesterday, hopes for tomorrow, joys and fears, and a story to be told. And if a moose has a life, so I reasoned with those awesome powers of deduction that I acquired from all those years in school, then I bet that a wolf has a life too. This gift of awareness was first presented to me by an anonymous mud-sucking moose, and I regifted it back to you in chapter one when we imagined the dreams of a wolf. If wolves and moose have lives, then the chickadee and the squirrel that live in town just outside our house, they have lives too. Being less familiar with the details of their lives in no way diminishes the fact. And those miserable ticks, they have lives too. Our minds are so obstinately anchored to our own experiences and perspectives more than we appreciate. It feels awkward to say, but I owe those ticks gratitude. They led me to this mud hole on a warm spring day where in a mild state of delirium, I wondered for the first time, are the thoughts of a moose beyond my imagination? Anyways, that's a reading from, from chapter two. Becky, All right, my, thoughts, thoughts oh, my thoughts on this uh, really have a lot to do with, you know, we teach population ecology and, um, you know, you get wrapped up in the moose and the wolves, um, but as you read this book, you get, you know, you start to realize the breadth of this, which is just looking at the ticks that are on that moose in the picture and, um, and their influence or their effect, um, their, their influence on their population. And then, you know, the amount of browse and the moose's population's effect on that. And it's just this whole domino effect that just emanates outward, you know, from, um, you know, from the wolves and the moose. And, um, you know, it, 
the whole field study going back to that is a lot of hurry up and wait i have a feeling <laughs> yes yes um, <laughs> but but it does leave you time to really think about and make observations of all things you're not there just looking at the moose or just looking at the wolves while you're busy waiting to do that you are also observing all kinds of other things so um it really yeah. broadens your view right right no i mean the perspective taking that has to be had is uh is jaw dropping i, I mean because the the story that that my colleagues and I know so well and have, have come to learn, obviously is a perspective primarily from those of the wolves and moose, but that, that perspective is in so many ways arbitrary. And there's a story to be told all about the ticks or a red squirrel or a chipmunk uh, that's, that's, that's no less fascinating. So yeah, no, it's uh, the perspective taking is at once necessary, otherwise it's disorienting, uh, but also comes at a cost, yeah. I, I just don't think ticks have lives. <laughs> <laughs> they would beg to differ. <laughs> I know, and and you may, yeah. Although, and I, I, I um, I killed a skunk this um summer. It was terrorizing our dogs. Um, Echo had gotten skunked twice, and F Abby had been skunked once, and this skunk actually kind of showed up for a dinner party. And the very next day, one of my board members dropped off an air gun with a scope. And I was able to successfully um, eliminate this skunk. And then I learned a whole lot of things about not trying to put a skunk into the garbage that the people collect because I couldn't enter my garage. And, I, and I'm like, okay, next time I kill a skunk, I will bury it. But um, I, I, you know, I mean, Echo kept trying to pick up the skunk and shake it in her mouth, and then she would end up foaming at the mouth, and it was just a disaster. But I know a whole bunch of people who um, capture them and bring them 25 miles out of town to release them, and maybe I should start doing that now, John. Well, <laughs> skunks are, are tough to live with, especially close by. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, the perspective taking is, is really um, remarkable because to take the perspective of another person takes an enormous amount of imagination, but it, but it's not fantasizing about things that aren't. It's about really trying to understand what actually is the perspective of that other. Think, think about your dogs, uh, Janet. Um, they, um, they learn most of what they know through their noses. I mean, I mean, you feel like you're very familiar with your own dogs. That's like a normal thing. And, and that familiarity is, is born from just that being around them all the time. But at the same time, their lives are so wildly different than ours. I mean, I mean it's, it's probably beyond our imagination to know what it's like to get most of our information through our noses. But, but wolves would do that. And then, and then again, to take a, a moose, um, they really do chew their cut for about eight hours a day. And now I'm a person that gets bored pretty easily. Um, but does boredom even mean anything to a moose? Uh, it might not. And, and I think the point is, is that you might misjudge that, uh, you know, a trait that a moose is able to cogitate or not. Um, but it's probably hard to d dishonor the moose while trying. And mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing about our relationship with nature. Is, uh, is trying to take the perspective of different creatures on the earth, humans and otherwise. And uh, while taking their perspective, again, I think it's hard to dishonor them. I mean, you could still accidentally mistreat them for misunderstanding, but, uh, but anyways. Um, so I've learned so many things from being on Isle Royal, many technical things, many mathy things, many things that have made my career. Um, but the most important things without a doubt uh, that I've ever learned are, uh, you know, reflected through the readings that I shared with you all tonight. And uh, if I understand things properly, this is designed to be kind of like a half hour sort of a setting. And I think we're right at that moment. And so is this the right time, Becky, to, or I'm sorry, Janet, to switch to a, a different mode? Well, if you have one more reading that you have selected, I think we have time for that. And all I'm right. sorry, I'm reading, I'm reading some of the questions already. Poor Ron, he lost his appetite for dinner. That was probably- Oh, well, that'll, that'll <laughs> happen. <laughs> no, that was during our pre-show. 
So sorry, sorry about that, Ron. Uh, sure. Me, um, <laughs> sure, I can do one more reading. Um, so this reading, um, again, we need a little context. Um, so the project began a long time ago in the late 1950s. And when the researchers who started the project, um, they watched, you know, for one year, second year, for the first five years or so, it didn't look like much changed in terms of the number of the wolves and moose. And so they concluded after watching for three or five years that the wolves and moose in Isle Royale had struck a balance of nature. Now balance of nature, um, that is one of the great themes in all of the history of thought. It's examined in our prehistory through mythologies. It's examined from the beginning of historic times with, for example, classic Greek and Roman philosophies. Balance of nature was an essential foundation for Darwin's thoughts. And by the early 20th century, balance of nature was beginning to be studied in the way that modern scientists do. And these studies began with a person whose name is Vito Volterra. And he developed some equations that made predictions that look like this. So this time across the bottom of that graph and then abundance of the predator and the prey, they kind of ebb and flow, they cycle in a certain kind of offset sort of way. So he wrote equations that said that that's what should happen. But that just came from his really creative mathematical mind. And then there were laboratory experiments that took place just a little later, this is 1930s, 1940s. And there was a person whose name was, uh, Gauss was his last name. He conducted these laboratory experiments which I'm going to tell you about in a moment, some detail, where he was trying to determine if those equations bore any resemblance to what might happen in nature, nature at least as much as you could have while in a test tube. And so his research results looked something like this graph, again, time across the bottom, measured in days, mind you. And then there's the abundance of the predator and the prey. We'll talk about them in just a moment. I mean, it only takes a quick glance to kind of see a superficial similarity. And then um, if we fast forward to the present day, this is what's happened with wolves and moose on Isle Royal. And, and again, these kind of similarities, uh, at least of the ebbing and the flowing part of it all are really quite striking. And so what the first researchers that started doing their work on Isle Royal, what they were trying to do, and they of course never, uh, they have uh, Dave Meech, who started the project, is still with us today. Derwood Allen passed away a little while ago. And so what they didn't know at the time in the early 60s when they said there was a balance of nature going on is to see how things would play out as they have today. And so um, what researchers in the 1960s were trying to do is find out if what happens in a mathematical equation and what happens in a test tube, does it happen in, in a bigger sense of nature? And so with that, this, this reading is, is intended to provide a little bit more of the context, especially about those laboratory experiments. Volterra shared his ideas with the world in a 1926 paper that concluded, it is to be hoped that this theory may receive further verification and it may be of some use to biologists. Now, Volterra's hope was quickly pursued by the Russian ecologist Georgi Gauss. Gauss devised a clever way to evaluate whether the scene that Volterra had painted bore any resemblance to the real world. Wanting a fair evaluation and believing that most of nature was more complicated than Volterra's Spartan equations could ever convey, Gauss needed some simple creatures in a simple environment. To this end, Gauss enlisted two species of single cell creatures that we call ciliated protozoans. Entire populations of these little fellows can live out their lives in a test tube or a petri dish of water. Ciliated protozoans are also easy to come by, found about in just about any scoop of pond water. Gauss selected Paramecium caudatum, which feeds on bacteria to represent the prey in his laboratory experiment, and Didinium, which feeds on those Paramecium to represent the predator. To prepare the study, Gauss dumped some oatmeal water, oats dumped some oatmeal in water, and inoculated the mixture with bacteria. Soon the water teemed with bacteria. He strained the oatmeal from the water, leaving a bacteria-rich broth. Then he poured less than a teaspoon of the broth into a test tube. Now these protozoans, they live at the edge of our visibility. If you were to hold a glass of water filled with paramecia to the light, you'd detect little flecks scooting about, but that's all. You'd see a bunch of someones and be able to count them, but you wouldn't really be able to discern what they're up to. But if you could, you'd know the potency of their life. 
if you could look closely, you'd know how much authentic nature is happening in this Gaussian universe. To see the tooth and claw of Gauss's microcosm, we need a better view. We need to shed the biased perspective we inherited with our gargantuan multicellular bodies. So let's make like Alice from Wonderland. Let's take a swig of that potion labeled drink me and watch ourselves shutting up like a telescope. This test tube is smaller than a rabbit hole, so we'd better take two swigs. And as quick as your imagination can conjure, a teaspoon of broth grows to the size of a large swimming pool. The water is littered with spheres, roughly the size, texture, and color of grapefruits. These are the many thousands of bacteria. Gauss has just, jumped, has just dumped exactly 10 paramecia into the pool with us. Now, these paramecia are shaped like fat cigars, about as long and large around as a slightly overweight human. Swim up and touch one, they're harmless. And you'll see that while they have shape, they're also pretty pliable. Their single cell bodies are covered with the strangest kind of shag carpet with fibers longer than any shag that you've seen, though not nearly as dense. A closer comparison might be that of a baldy man with the habit of cone movers who's just jumped into the water. Those long wavy hairs are the cilia. They pulse in unison, propelling each paramecium through the water in search of dense schools of bacteria. If bacteria are plentiful, one paramecium can consume 100 bacteria in an hour. When a young paramecium eats, eats as much as it likes, then in just about five or six hours, about half of the paramecium's insides migrate to each end of its unicellular, unicellular body, and the cell membrane begins to contract in the middle and then pinches off in a process that takes just a few minutes. Where there had been one paramecium, we are now staring at two half-sized paramecia, each scoot off in their own direction in search of more bacteria. In 24 hours, the population of 10 paramecia has increased to about 30. In 48 hours, it's hard to swim around without occasionally bumping into one. Our swimming pool is now inhabited by more than 100 paramecia. At this moment, Gauss drops three didinia into our swimming pool. They're barrel shaped, shaped, slightly smaller than a paramecia and agile all, owing to cilia emanating from two bands located where the quarter hoops of a hog's head of whiskey would be. If you'd like a picture, there you have it. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> you see sacs embedded in a translucent membrane of their skin. It is these cysts, I'm sorry, each of these cysts is packed with needle-like filaments when a didindia detects a paramecia nearby, I have no idea how they do this. They are creatures that have no eyes or ears or nerve cells of any kind because their entire body is just one cell. They eject those filaments, penetrating the paramecium skin. Oh, I forgot to mention the toxins. The filaments are coated with toxins to immobilize the paramecium and they begin digesting its insides before the paramecium has even swallowed it. The didinium retracts the filaments and the paramecium is still attached and the uh, with the paramecium still attached, and the paramecium may be folded in half as its body is pulled into the didinium. I've mixed up my pages here, so I gotta find this page right here. So this picture is um, the thing attaching the paramecium. Yeah, the predator is on the top, the didinium, and uh, and and then what's below is the prey. And so it's an, another instance where the prey is bigger than the predator. Mm. And so, uh, because I mismanaged my pages here a little bit, I'll back up to, to just the last sentence here. So the didinium retracts the filaments with the paramecium still attached, and the paramecium may be folded in half as it's pulled into the didinium's mouth. The didinium had been smaller than the paramecium until it was stretched on all sides from the inside by the freshly consumed prey. Oh my gosh, watch out, right behind you, a didinium. I would not get too close. Now, paramecium. They're not helpless in all of this. They have similar sacs embedded in their skin. If triggered at the opportune moment, they foil a didinium's toxin, toxic filaments, sidelining the didinium from the hunt for 20 or 30 minutes as it regenerates those spent toxocysts. An especially skilled didinium captures and consumes about five paramecium a day, depending on how easily the next paramecium is found. When didinium have had enough to eat, they undergo, like their prey, the torturous looking process of binary fusion. Now, while this 
Gaussian universe is a laboratory experiment in a glass tube. Do not overlook the raw peril and don't fail to appreciate the complexity. What happens next is well beyond knowing without continuing to watch. Within 24 hours of being dropped into the tank, those three didinia had consumed scores of paramecia and increased their own kind to about 25. The abundance of paramecia plummeted from more than 100 to about 35. A day later, the number of didinia held steady and the paramecia population struggled against extinction. A day later, the paramecia were extinct. The didinia, now with nothing to eat, went extinct the following day. All that remained were bacteria feeding on the carcasses. In addition to the miniaturized space of this tank, time passes differently. You and I are accustomed to measuring time in hours and days, but life meters out time with each passing generation, whose duration varies depending on the species. For humans, a generation is about 25 years. For moose, it's about nine years. And for wolves, a generation is about four years. Gauss's evaluation lasted only six days. That might seem like a flash, but those six days saw the passage of more than 20 paramecium generations. By comparison, six decades of wolf-moose dynamics on Isle Royale is just 15 generations. That's right, don't forget Isle Royale. The history of balance of nature is worthy of attention for its own sake, but our particular interest is a rich understanding with Durwood Allen, he started the project. Durwood Allen's declaration that the wolves and moose of Isle Royale had struck a reasonably good balance. And that is a reading from chapter four. And um, yeah, well, anyways, uh, Becky and, and Janet, both, what are, any thoughts or questions? Well, uh, I think, oh, I, okay. I, I think uh, what really strikes me about this is the reason of this study, the reason why we hope that you continually have financing for this, because life is complicated and you can you can make a little you know a little lab experiment that can show a lot and it does a lot of modeling which is really helpful on the big on the big you know scene of things yeah. um but you know it's the unexpected that you can't account for you know like there's it's not wild in those test tubes but it's wild on isle royal and you don't know what's going to happen between yeah. the weather the climate the yeah. you know who knows what yeah, no, those you've you mentioned just enough things, uh, you know, the, the climate, you mentioned a few earlier in our conversation about the different species that are involved, and those are more than enough connections, and not surprisingly, that after six decades, we're, we're nowhere close to running out of questions to ask and, and to also answer, and so it really is, is remarkable in that way. The other thing that I think is important, for me anyways, about the whole thing, and it's been a theme throughout, and I don't know, something about the abstraction of these paramecias might make it easier, is that their lives can be viewed at two levels at the same time. There's the level of the individual organisms and what their lives are all about at the very same time, but at a very different level, there are those population dynamics that are occurring. It occurs for the individual wolves and moose on Isle Royale, uh, but it's also, again, how many moose are there and how many wolves and how are those numbers changing over time and how are those numbers affecting each other? How are the lives of the wolves and the moose affected by the fact that sometimes there's a ton of moose, sometimes not so many. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's really been an uh, endless source of fascination for me, this kind of multi-level nature of life, really. And uh, yeah, it's been been quite rich. Anyways, those are um, those are a few excerpts from the book. Um, it, it really does have a number of different threads of writing in it. As I mentioned, there's some memoir, history of science. You saw a little bit of that. There's some environmental philosophy, some good old fashioned science. Um, mm -hmm. And so, if you like some of the readings tonight, I think you'll 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 enjoy the the book as well. So, well, well and let me um, let, why don't you go ahead and stop sharing now, John? So we're we're going to move into the Q and A um, portion, and um, so um, Becky and John, both of you can pull up questions using the Q&A feature. And while you're doing that, Becky, um, I failed to explain that you are a teacher. Um, will you name your school and, and what subject you teach? Sure. Uh, so a shout out to my Lower Dauphin uh, fellow teachers and possible students. Um, I'm in central Pennsylvania, just outside of Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, I migrated there, I guess you could say, or uh, I guess emigrated there from the UP uh, and um, 
ended up staying. And although my husband and I did backpack Isle Royal, and that is where he proposed to me. So I just like on Mount, on uh, Lake Desor, uh, I am here in Pennsylvania now. And, um, and I teach environmental science and earth science to ninth graders. So that's, sure. that's my role. Very good. And their vineyard, if you're ever going in the Hershey area, is called Castle Vineyards. And they have a website, castlevineyards.com, and that's C-A-S-S-E-L. Uh, and your father's name is Tom Lippart. What was his degree in? His degree was metallurgy, and he graduated, I saw a question on there, he graduated in 1959. Okay. So he's a bit older than the gentleman who asked <laughs> by a couple of All right. years. <laughs> well, and so, no John, do you, do you see a question you want to answer? Oh, sure. And I, I um, of course, it's challenging to multitask. And so I think I picked out a couple of questions, but I wouldn't mind a, a little help from you all if you can feed me a couple of them. But I, at least I got three in my head and I think I can answer them. So one question is, what's the current wolf population on Isle Royale? Uh, we last counted wolves uh, this past winter. There were 28 wolves approximately. Um, it's our best estimate. Um, the we, we missed a year because of COVID being able to count the wolves. So the last time we counted wolves was about two years ago. So in that two year interval, the wolf population had in, increased from about a dozen to the most recent estimate about 28. Um, some of you may know that in 2019, uh, 2018, 2019, the National Park Service restored wolf predation to Isle Royal by bringing wolves there. And so um, that restoration effort uh, by now is uh, in, in every way that we can imagine measuring uh, successful. Um, the wolf population is very well established. There's two social groups there, two packs. They've both reproduced. Um, and so, yeah, wolf population is doing great. I saw a question about um, what brought my attention, what, what made me interested in wolves and moose in the first place. You know, they, they found me. I don't think I found them. Um, I grew up in a suburb of Detroit, and I wanted to go to school as far away from home as possible. I had a wonderful home, but I also wanted to disperse. And uh, but it needed to be in state tuition. And so from Detroit, Michigan Tech is as far away as you can get from Detroit and still be in state. <laughs> that essentially is how I chose my college. And so when I was 18 years old, um, freshman in college, I worked with uh, Rolf Peterson, who is was leading the project at the time. He's still with the project now. Um, and uh, I did things like make photocopies, uh, identify food items and coyote scats, uh, did field work on Isle Royal um, when it started when I was 18. And to make a long story short, I kind of just never left. And <laughs> um, so that's how I became interested. It, again, you couldn't plan that in one's life. It kind of kind of just happened. Um, and there was a question about uh, what happened in 1979. That's a little bit because I could read the question quickly and kind of come to see it. I got to find the question. I got to find out where that graph is. Hold on one second. Right. Um, while you're doing that, there's a question from the Facebook live stream. Um, yes. Do the ticks that harm the moose also have a negative effect on the wolves? Ah, right. Yes. The, the tick question. Ticks are such curious creatures in so many different ways. There are, um, there's like 300 species of ticks around the world. The ticks that we're most familiar with are not especially characteristic. So we're, we're familiar with like a dog tick or a deer tick. And think, think about like dog ticks. A dog tick is kind of happy taking the blood of almost any mammal. But most ticks, this is true for the moose tick or the winter tick, which are two names for the same creature, uh, they're specialists. They only like members of the deer family. And so an Isle Royal, that, that means moose. And if they, if, if a tick is unfortunate enough to find itself on a wolf or even a human, they don't do well. The first thing that they don't do well with is they don't settle in anywhere too quickly. And they crawl around looking for a good spot and they can't find one on a human or a wolf. And in all that crawling around, they get detected and then usually crunched either in between the incisors of the of wolf teeth or between, to, between your fingers. And so, um, so, so while occasionally a tick will find its way to a wolf or a moose and occasionally they'll bore in, it's one or two ticks, handful of ticks at, at, at the most. And so it's really a creature that's that's trouble for the for the moose. Um, what happened in 1970? Oh, I got to share my screen here for you guys to see this. Um, let me just take just a moment. Um, 
And so I think you can see my cursor wagging around. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what we're talking about here, this dark, I'm sorry, uh, this line with the open circles, this shows the wolves. And so this is 1980. Wolves were at an all time high and then they collapsed uh, over just a two year period. What happened there is that uh, canine parvovirus is a disease that affects domestic dogs as well as, as wolves. Um, if we go back to say 1978, 1977, it's a disease that did not exist anywhere in the universe. It's a newly evolved disease in the late 1970s, uh, a pond first evolving from a cat disease. It uh, found its way into dogs, spread around the world in a very short time, less than a year, found itself into some wolf populations, including Isle Royal, and that's what that collapse was all about. Um, and then because somebody might ask, this big collapse right here in the moose population, uh, occurred because there was a very, very, well, a conver convergence of two reasons. One, there were an awful lot of moose. They had to come down. The only question was how would they come down? And that was the winter of 1996, which was extremely severe. And so it was a combination of there being so many moose and then a very, very severe winter. So anyways, that was a question about what happened in 1979, 1980, right up in there. So uh, uh, Janet or, or Becky, another question, if you wouldn't mind to share one with me. Uh, let's see. Let's look at some here. Um, why don't you repeat the name of the book, Jim? Um, oh, sure. Like, and how do you get it? I, I imagine. Sure. The book is called uh, Restoring the Balance. It's published by Johns Hopkins University Press. You can find it um, at Johns Hopkins University Press webpage, and you can also find it on Amazon. And um, those are the two easiest places I would imagine to find it. And so, yeah, came uh, published in uh, last year. Um, I found one for you. So it says, if healthy, uh, if a healthy mature moose severely injures a wolf, will that wolf's pack eat them? Or what happens to that wolf? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I missed the first part of the question. Sure, if it's, if it's a healthy, if healthy mature moose severely injures a wolf, oh right, will their pack eat them? Uh, they won't eat them, um, and they're they're gonna probably not take too much effort to care for them, but they're not gonna make their lives worse. Um, and so that that wolf would struggle to kind of keep up in whatever way that it that it could. Yeah, it would be. Not good. Wolves, um, they sustain injuries of, of a variety of kinds. Um, in places like Alaska, where wolves are uh, killed frequently by humans, there's an, an opportunity to conduct autopsies on them. It's, it's hard to find an adult wolf that doesn't have a number of its rig ribs broken and then rehealed. Many of those injuries are caused by being kicked. And so it's kind of a routine sort of a way to get injured. Kicked, or if, if you like, thrown into trees. Um, by a, a wolf that's kind of, or by a moose that's kind of, uh, you know, just thrown it basically. Um, it's possible for a wolf to, uh, it's possible for a moose to, to crack the cranium of, of a skull. And so that's really, I mean, it's a thousand pound animal. It's a very big animal with a very powerful host. And so, um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's a and, remarkable and, sort of thing. And from Nicole, who is one of our um, regular Husky Bitesers who lives in Alaska now, um, she um, says, as a note, the ticks on moose are becoming a huge problem, not just for moose, but the food chain. Mothers are unable to feed calves, and thus populations in Alaska are being reduced. And she also wanted to just um, just warn people that moose are much bigger than you think, and please be careful if you see them. <laughs> yeah, no, they deserve as much they deserve as much uh, birth and 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 uh, and space as, as a wolf does. I see there's a comment from Pippin out there. Hello, Pippin. Pippin is a good friend of mine from many many years ago. Uh, he and I went to school together at Michigan Tech. Another question? Oh, well, I can see one right straight away. How do these diseases get on the island? So, is canine parvovirus got to Isle Royal? Uh, pr presumably by one of a couple of means. A, a dog would have been brought to Isle Royal and then would have defecated on the island while it was there. And then uh, parvo can be passed through basically a, a wolf coming to smell that. It's not allowed to bring dogs to Isle Royal, but yeah. uh, the, that rule is uh, occasionally violated. And so that's almost certainly how that happened. Um, here's one, and, and I'm curious about this too, with the um, the reinstating of uh, more wolves on the on the island. 
Um, the question is, how many distinct packs or family groups of wolves are there on the island? Right now, there's, um, I should say, as, as of this past winter, there were, there were two well-formed packs. And, mm -hmm. and while many, though, uh, maybe not everyone knows, a, a pack is basically just a family group. And so a pack is usually two parents, a male and a female, and then their offspring, offspring from the most recent year, as well as offspring from, from previous years. And so you may have offspring that are one, two, three, four years old. The way that packs work, uh, not unlike human families, is that when the offspring are born, uh, they, they need a fair bit of help to make sure that they get all the food that they need, but eventually they're big enough, strong enough, smart enough to make it on their own. And then some of these wolves that are old enough, they try to disperse. And when they disperse, uh, they're trying to find another wolf of the opposite sex who's doing the same thing. And when they hook up, um, they then next try to find a place uh, to make territory. And if they are successful in doing so, then they'll, they'll mate, so they'll have pups, and then that's how a new pack is born. And in Isle Royal's long history, it's been most common for there to be three packs on Isle Royal. It's not always the case, but it's the most common scenario. Right now we have two packs on Isle Royal. So one of the things we are kind of eager to look for is to see if these two packs will become three. And if so, how does that happen? Does it end up being, you know, individuals from the two different packs getting together? But of course they gotta they gotta find some space on the island. And so um, anyways, that's a little bit about how that happens. No, it's fascinating. So here's a question from Harry, who I just met last week. Um, he, uh, Harry um, used to port it, do a lot of portage and hiking and dragging a canoe through the Boundary Waters area. So he said once in the Boundary Waters canoe area, he saw a cow moose doing a backstroke across a lake with a youngster balanced on her stomach. As she approached the shoreline, she flipped over and both disappeared into the forest. Well, that, is a, yeah, that, is, that is a remarkable sighting. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. But I, but I think that's all that I can say to it is that would be what that would be a remarkable sighting. Well, uh, it, yeah. there's some questions kind of about our wolves, any threat to tourists on Isle Royale and maybe like, you know, are wolves a threat to us here in the UP? Yeah, uh, no, uh, wolves are not a threat to human, not at least not any more than any other kind of wild animal. Um, wolves, for, you know, for the most part are afraid of humans, and so they, they steer clear of us. Um, if you were afraid of a wolf, you really owe a great deal more fear to other things like being killed in an automobile by hitting a white-tailed deer because that actually does happen. And kind of sadly, frequently, um, you're more likely to get struck by lightning many, many times over than, um, than being injured, injured by a wolf. They're, 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 again, no more a threat than any other kind of wild animal um, that's out and about, in, including white-tailed deer and, and, and moose. Well, do you have any idea about how many wolves there might be in the UP? Oh, I do not know the answer to that question. It's been a little while since I've kept on that, so I, so I, I'm afraid I can't answer that one. Yeah, um, I'm curious about that, and I know you can't answer it, but um, you know, in the '80s when I was going to high, when I was up there in in high school, I mean, there were no wolves that I'm aware of. I mean, I right. never knew they existed anywhere near us. So it's very yeah. interesting in that amount of time. It's really yeah, no, no, it's it really so. Wolves are, um, I mean, at, at their lowest state in the lower 48, um, wolves were limited to just, I mean, nobody knows for sure, but maybe just a dozen or so wolves in northern Minnesota, and maybe a handful of wolves in, uh, literally a handful of wolves, half a dozen or something like that in northern Montana. That's all. And, and in the last 40 years, there's you know, thousands of wolves in the lower 48. It is two things at the same time. It is one of the most remarkable conservation success stories in the United States or the world. And at the same time, it's one of our greatest tragedies because we still haven't learned to live well with them. And, um, and so it won't really be a complete success until we learn to live well with them. We've decided to live with them, but we haven't quite yet decided to live well with them. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to just explain um, the rationale to repopulate the wolves on the island? And so did they, did they, were there no wolves at one point on the island? Sure. Very, very briefly what happened is that um, wolves on Isle Royal are 
just that they're on an island, so their population is never very large. And so that means they're vulnerable to inbreeding. And what was not known for a long time, but what was happening for a long time, is that occasionally a wolf would come from the mainland Canada, cross an ice bridge to get to Isle Royale, and that would bring an infusion of new genes and stave off inbreeding. That process seems to have gone on for decades. And then what has happened because of climate warming is that um, ice bridges have become less common and they've become just less common enough that wolves don't come from the mainland frequently enough. And so the wolf population started to suffer greatly from all that inbreeding. They dwindled to just uh, two wolves. And this would have been, oh gosh, five-ish years ago or so we're talking about. And uh, it's when wolves were in that very, very low state of, of just two. And they, they were two wolves that were very, very unlikely to, con to, to reproduce. So they, they almost certainly would have been the last two wolves on Isle Royal. Anyways, it was at that uh, point in time, now we're talking like 2018, 2019, that the National Park Service decided that the right thing to do was to restore wolf predation on Isle Royal. Um, and so, so that's, that's what they did. That's why it happened. And uh, yeah, it, it, re well, it represents um, kind of an important uh, decision for the Park Service. It's a special case of something that kind of sadly is gonna happen more frequently in our other national parks. One of the great principles of a national park is a notion of, uh, you know, kind of letting nature take its course. And, um, and one of the things that's going to happen is that climate change is going to make it difficult for isolated national parks to just take their course all by themselves without any help from humans, and then for us to expect them to get along just fine. And so if, if we want to protect some things in some of our national parks, uh, to protect them from climate change, we, we may have to make the decisions to make those kinds of interventions in the future. Not every case in all national parks will, will, will be the same, um, but Isle Royal kind of represents uh, an important um, exploration of that question for the National Park Service, and of course, then their decision to go ahead and, and make that intervention. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm sad to say there's 20 open questions, 28 answered questions, but we are just over the hour. So um, what I what I want to do is um, give each of you a, just an opportunity to make some closing remarks, um, starting with Becky, and then and then um, uh, you know John, you'll close us out. And, and before I do that, I just want to thank the audience for joining us. And uh, I I learned a lot. Um, I um, I have been imagining my skunk's last few moments with horror and realizing what a terrible person I am. So I, I apologize for bringing up that episode. Um, and I just want to just thank the audience out there for joining us again. Um, and uh, and and John and Becky, Becky, thank you for bringing this study to my attention and John's work to my attention. And John, thanks for. Um, Thanks for speaking. Uh, and so Becky, some closing remarks. Uh, well, first of all, thanks. This is a real privilege to be invited and in being a part of this discussion. Um, I just think that it, it just goes to show the extents of the connections for all animal, well, biotic and abiotic, so plants and animals. So, you know, if you let one thing get away in a national park or anywhere, then that's gonna affect a million other things in ways that you have no idea. So it's important to keep, you know, the balance of life as best that we can. And if, you know, if we need to help with that, then I think that's, you know, not a bad thing. So, but um, I think this was a great experience and John, it was a pleasure to meet you and uh, get to talk to you a little bit about this study. So thank you very much. Yes, 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 my gosh. Uh, Janet, Becky, this is a great opportunity. I, I don't know that I have any closing thoughts um, uh, other than just the gratitude for being able to, to take the time to share. And, uh, and if, if you enjoyed what you heard this evening, I think you'd enjoy reading the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us and I hope you all have a good um, evening uh, and we'll see you next week. Good night. Bye-bye.